My name is Terry Rioff. I'm the president of the Skylight Astronomical Society here. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we've got a really special speaker today. Um, this is uh, Leon Golub. Dr. Leon Golub is a senior astrophysicist from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. He's been studying the sun and solar type stars since the Skylab missions in 73 and 74 and the Einstein Observatory in 78. He's head of the Solar Stellar X-ray Group at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and former chair of the Solar Physics Division of the American Astronomical Society. He's written several books in his field, uh, The Sol Solar Corona, The Nearest Star, The Surprising Science of Our Sun, as well as a children's book called Earth, Moon, and Sun. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Leon See if I can move this. Yes. I think we're okay. I'll try to stay away from the gates. Right. <laughs> um, maybe we can get the lights. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, an alternative title for this talk could have been, The Sun is Trying to Kill You. <laughs> You'll see why. Um, this is a picture of the corona of the sun. Uh, it was taken with a telescope that our group built. It's on the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And what you're seeing here is what I'll be talking about. Uh, just so you know, these are active regions. There are sunspots under them and visible light. The structures you're seeing are due to magnetic fields. So I will have to talk about magnetic fields, even though uh, it's hard because we don't experience them directly. It's hard to relate to fields. I'll get to that. Uh, the sun has been studied for a long time, uh, for instance. Um, mostly in order to have a calendar, um, especially at uh, latitudes away from the equator where there are big seasonal differences and you tend to grow crops or you're migrating and you need to know when it's time to do things that are related to the seasons. And uh, structures like this typically are calendars. Um, but also, especially down near the equator, uh, people have realized that the sun is a big influence on our lives. I especially like this one from Egypt uh, because it shows a sort of solar wind of lotus blossoms. Uh, uh, and there is a solar wind, although certainly they didn't know that. But you can feel the influence of the sun very definitely. The influence is mainly in the amount of energy we get from the sun in the form of light. And I mean light in the broadest sense, infrared, ultraviolet, mostly visible. Uh, and there's a certain level that's fairly constant. Notice the zero on this scale is way down there. So this variation from the sun is something we've only been able to measure recently. Uh, one of the first uh, directors of the Smithsonian, a fellow named Abbott, spent 70 years trying to measure the variation of the solar output uh, as a function of the solar cycle. People knew by then that sunspots come and go, and he thought there would be a change in the amount of energy coming from the sun throughout the cycle, but it was too small to measure from the ground. 
atmospheric effects um, make that precise measurement impossible. So once we had satellites up, uh, we could measure the solar constant, and it's not completely constant. It varies by about a tenth of a percent. Uh, and this is due to the activity cycle on the sun, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit. Um, I get asked very often, is, you know, is the sun responsible for the global warming, or is it involved in it? And the answer is the sun does have an influence, but it is not the main influence anymore. It used to be. Um, although volcanic activity is also, was also a, a huge influence. But this is the recent uh, rise in average global t air temperature. And it's, it's really off the chart, literally. The sun has been, the solar constant averaged over the cycles has been doing this during that time. Temperatures have been doing that. And you can see that there's very little correlation between what the sun is doing and what the temperatures are doing. Uh, CO2, on the other hand, is very strongly correlated. That's the main influence. So, uh, the, put it another way, the sun, people noticed for a while, the, the sunspot numbers were increasing. You can see these are the sunspot numbers. So they were going up. Um, and it looked like maybe that was driving this, but the sunspot numbers have been going down again in recent years. Temperatures keep going up. So that, that idea hasn't worked. So what is this sunspot cycle? Uh, the sunspots are the main visible manifestation. Uh, they've been observed for thousands of years. Uh, there are Chinese records going back to uh, 2000 BC. Nobody knows really why they were observing sunspots. Uh, if it was a regular thing, you would have more records. The records are very spotty. Um, so it's not clear. Nobody seems to know why they were doing it. But at least we know there were sunspots visible back then. And that's just sort of the, the beginning of the story. If you measure the magnetic fields, uh, which were first measured in sunspots by George Ellery Hale, um, it's quite amazing the things that Hale did. Uh, this was at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, when I got into this field, someone told me, you're going to have a hard time doing something that Hale didn't do 50 years ago. It turned out to be true. Uh, he invented basically all the modern methods that ground-based observatories still use. And he used a method that had recently been announced by a physicist named Zeeman, who got the Nobel Prize for it, um, to measure magnetic fields in a hot gas uh, by looking at the uh, spectra of certain elements. They're influenced by the presence of the magnetic field and he had this idea from looking at sunspots, especially using this new instrument he had invented called the spectroheliograph, uh, which is still used today, um, that the sunspots are surrounded by what look like swirling patterns. And he thought, well, that, that looks like what you see around a magnet. And indeed, 
he measured magnetic fields, very strong ones, 3,000 Gauss. The average field of the Earth is about one Gauss um, in these sunspots. And what you're seeing here is a modern magnetograph. And the magnetic field strength in our direction is indicated by black and white. So white would be field emerging toward us, black would be field going back into the sun. And these sunspots were found to be in bipolar regions. Bipolar meaning you always have the black and white together. And that led to the idea that fields emerge from inside the sun like a, a loop, an omega. So when the field emerges, it goes out and comes back in. And in the late 60s, we began to be able to look at the sun from space, first on sounding rockets, which go up for five minutes, and come back down on a parachute. If you're lucky, the parachute opens. I've lost a few that way. Um, but five minutes is a lot better than zero. And you can look at new wavelengths that don't reach the ground, and I'll show you that in a minute. And what you can look at is the corona, which is very hot, millions of degrees. And you can see the structures in the corona that are above the sunspots. And uh, I'll talk a lot more about that, but that is what allows you to see the connectivity of the fields. Which of these regions are connected to the other ones? So this activity of the sun um, was discovered in the 19th century to come and go in cycles. An amateur named Schwab um, measured sunspots every day that it wasn't cloudy for 30 years. Might have been more than 30. He waited for two full solar cycles to report his measurements. And then he continued them for another cycle. And none of that was noticed until uh, what was his name? You know, the, not Helmholtz, but it was a name like that. In in uh, hmm? What? In in he was German, early 19th century, with a great explorer. Oh. Damn, I can't remember his name now. It'll come back to me. He wrote a book called Cosmos. And in that book, he reported Schwab's measurements. And then <laughs> they reached public attention. Uh, we've been measuring the spun sunspot cycles ever since then. They average about 11 years between peaks or between minima. The minima are kind of easier to measure. Um, but sometimes they're much longer. Sometimes they're shorter. So it's not perfectly regular. And they, they come in pairs. That's another story, but the sunspots follow a rule called Hale's Law. Again, Hale figured that out, that they're oriented a certain way. And then in the next cycle, they're oriented in the reverse way. So two cycles make a complete cycle. So this illustrates what a cycle looks like. So at maximum, there's a huge amount of magnetic field emerging. The corona, the X-ray emission, the high temperatures are very strong. You go to minimum, the sun 
sunspots spots go away, the emission is very weak, and then it, it all comes back. So what this connection between the corona and the magnetic fields gives you is this very tangled, very dynamic atmosphere. And that's where the activity that we study is happening. So that's, this is just a small piece of the sun. That's the limb. These are active regions sticking up above the limb. So why do we go to all this trouble? And putting an instrument up in space is not easy. It's, it's very high risk, it's expensive, it takes a long time. The problem is that of all the wavelengths of light, and again, by light I mean electromagnetic radiation, so you're going from radio to gamma rays. Very little of it reaches the ground. The part we call visible is an exception. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's why it is the visible. I mean, we've adapted to what's there. But all these other wavelengths don't reach us. This is what we would need in order to study the activity, and it, it doesn't come close. It gets absorbed about 100, at an altitude of about 100 kilometers. So you have to get above that to, to see this. Uh, you can't use airplanes or balloons. They don't get high enough. That's supposed to be a sounding rocket, which barely makes it up there. And then satellites are in orbit high enough. So this is a typical sounding rocket. That's me there. That's the rocket. Our instrument is way up there. That's what a launch looks like. Um, that's our telescope. So the way this works, this is a two-stage rocket. That's an old Nike anti-aircraft missile. Mm -hmm. It was designed to get things up really fast. So it burns for five seconds. And at the end of that, we're, we're supersonic. Then it falls away. The second stage takes over. That's a black brand that's made by a Canadian company. It burns for 30 seconds. And we're going about Mach 7 at that point. The, the payload then continues on up. They have a gyroscopic system here that swings it around, a sensor that finds the sun, points it at the sun, stabilizes it, holds the pointing, and all of that from launch till you're taking data takes about 90 seconds. It's really quite amazing. Then we get about 300 seconds of observing before it re-enters the atmosphere. <coughs> the parachute is up here. And if you're lucky, it opens. Um, twice I've lost payloads. Once because it opened on the way up. <laughs> As the rocket launch crew down there says, We'll fix that problem and find another way to screw up next time. <laughs> okay. To really see what's going on, you need longer observations. And this uh, will show you one rotation worth of. Uh, Corona, a rotation of the sun. There is no one number actually that tells you, but 
the nominal length is 27 days. The, the equator rotates faster than the pole. So in fact, the very equator comes around in about 25 days. The poles take about 32 days. You can see that on Jupiter. If you look at movies of Jupiter. But the sun does that too. I'll just let you watch this. Uh, what, what you're seeing here are the changes that are due to the magnetic fields coming up and then spreading across the surface. That's what gives you the activity of the sun this constant rearrangement of magnetic fields uh, which are being produced by a dynamo inside same way the earth does the same basic mechanism uh, it's just the earth's dynamo takes a hundred thousand years to change sign the sun takes eleven very odd um, but really it's because the liquid core inside the Earth is moving so slowly. Let's see if I can get back, yes. Now one of the things we found when we started observing the corona from space uh, was that there are eruptions that blast out from the sun. This is seen in visible light um, using an instrument called the coronagraph. The corona can be seen in visible light, basically light that scatters from the photosphere off the electrons in the corona but you have to cover up the disk of the sun in order to see the, the white light corona. It's about a million times fainter than the disk. So if you don't cover it up, you don't see it. And also it helps to be in space because the atmosphere scatters the visible light. So coronagraphs from the ground don't give you images this good. Anyway, they discovered uh, these large events crossing the field of view. Remember at the time they were called coronal transients. Um, since that time, uh, we've realized that the main thing that happens in one of these eruptions is that a huge cloud of the coronal plasma is ejected. It's sent out from the sun. As typical typically about a billion tons of matter and it comes at us at about a million miles an hour and what you're seeing here is one of these events growing and expanding as it comes out and then it has left the sun entirely they go in all directions sometimes they come toward us a more modern uh, coronagraph shows you another such event. The sun is that big and you see two different uh, coronal mass ejections. You also see this whole shower of what looks like snow. That is high energy particles produced by that event hitting the detector. So that's a huge cloud of cosmic rays that arrives at the same time as the light does from the event because they're very high energy particles. They're traveling at the speed of light. Um, what that means is uh, it's dangerous to be out in space because if one of these events from the sun happens it sends these high energy particles uh, crashing down on you 
uh, the source of such an event is a region on the sun. Um, this is one that we call the Bastille Day event. Can I get it to start again? July 14th. Um, and if, uh, if I go back, at the very beginning, you'll see the ejection coming toward us. There it is, leaving the sun, coming toward us. What you're seeing, all, all these white, bright loops, are just the corona healing itself, closing back up after the event loop leaves. That's one of the indicators we have when we look at the corona that such an event occurred. You see this material leaving, you see these darkenings, you see these post-event loops. So we can tell that this event has happened. And that's becoming a, a major area now that uh, it's not exactly solar research, but it's become an important area for our technological society. It's called space weather. It affects basically anything that has electronics in it, which is pretty much everything uh, that we deal with these days. Yes? So if it's dangerous to be in space, what about Space Lab? They've yes. been out there for years. So is it protected in some way, or can you talk about that a little bit? It is a big concern for them. They have special shielded lockers that they can climb into. You need a lot of <clears throat> a lot of protection, a lot, which means a lot of mass to protect you from these high energy particles. Also, in low Earth orbit, a lot of them are deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. That's not as bad as being out in interplanetary space. If you're going to Mars, you've got a real problem. And when you're talking about high energy particles, it, it seems like you were conflating gamma rays with, with protons. So gamma rays aren't going to be affected by the magnetic field. It's not very much. That's right. And the, 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 but the rest of it is all protons coming at us? Or is it in a complex nuclei or what? It's everything. Uh, the, it's mainly protons, and there are some heavier ions in small numbers. But it, it's whatever the corona is made of, that's what gets sent out at us. Whatever happens to the electrons? Are they left behind? They're going up and away? Well, the electrons are there too. They are less dangerous. Um, they tend to be lower energy and easier to stop. It's really the high energy protons that are the most damaging. So all in all, one of these eruptive events is, is a complex bit of business. It starts with a multi-part configuration on the sun all related to the magnetic field. There's this prominence uh, or filament, depends whether it's on the disk or off the disk, that's supported by the magnetic field. It can become unstable and erupt. It forms a cavity as it erupts. You get a shock wave, a plasma front that probably accelerates the particles. It's actually a big question right now where these particles are accelerated. Is it here or here or in between? It's not easy to observe where it happens. So that's an ongoing question. But in terms of the space weather effects, the effects on the Earth, this is the main thing that we worry about. Um, this is really just another 
another version of that same picture. That's the structure. This very dense, cool material that erupts with the magnetic field. There's that as it's erupting. You notice this event becomes huge as it leaves the sun. That's the sun. And it started out as this little tiny thing. So it, it's, it swells up to an enormous size as it leaves. We've developed not just ways to observe such events, but techniques for seeing them in an especially sensitive way. So what you're going to see is uh, uh, a difference image movie. So you take a sequence of observations and you display the differences from one image to the next. So if something moves into a, a new re area, or if it brightens, it will show up as white, and where it leaves or where it dims is black. You'll see an eruption here. Right? This is the disk of the sun. These are regions that are sunspot regions that are not especially active. The eruption happens here. And you'll see a huge shock front form and leave but it also goes the other way, and you'll see secondary interactions behind it. So here's the eruption, here's the front weaving, and a wave passes across the whole sun, interacts with those regions, and a lot of this cool material falls back down, as well as being thrown off. So is this, uh, are these like Coriolis currents in the plasma that causes these dynamics? Or what, what's the source of the, uh, these, these types of, what's the, what's the source of all the dynamics? You can look at it as either the fields getting twisted or as currents uh -huh. being stored in the corona. Either way, you get energy stored in the fields, and it gets released in a reconfiguration. So the fields relax to a lower energy state. The events we see are a consequence of that um, relaxation. Yes? Does the temperature of the space interfere with the force, the energy of the release by the sun? Because minus 4.29. I mean, that, that energy will be leaking instantly as soon as it hits the uh, temperature of the space. Makes sense. It's a complicated question. The space around, the space doesn't so much affect the event, but I'll show you in a second. The event does expand as it leaves, so the energy density goes down. Um, but there's also I mean, the sun is bombarded. By the main the thing that influences these events is previous events. The space around the sun is filled with material that's been leaving, um, and the eruption interacts with that material, tries to move past it, gets slowed down by it, compresses it. So that's the main influence on these events as they transit out from the sun. Let me show you one of the uh, early models. So this is a model of a mass ejection. So that, there's the sun. These are the magnetic field lines. And you'll follow an event out from the sun. 
it's a model, but it's it's based on a real event. So this is modeling from available measurements what was actually seen. So there's the event that leaves the sun and starts to expand. So you have to change the scale of what you're looking at. Okay, the sun is now smaller in this in this view. Now what you can do, if you feel like it, you can zero in on a what you might call an arbitrary point in space, make a finer grid so you can see small things, and then zoom in on a little tiny region. You have to zoom in a lot. And finally, you see this little planet that's sitting there at 200 solar radii, which is us, when the event hits. Now what's going on from that? Earth has a magnetic field left to itself, just the Earth not bothered by anything. You'd have a very simple field. This is the north magnetic, the north pole of the Sun, but in fact the north magnetic pole is down here. It's a simple dipole field if there's nothing happening. There is though this steady wind coming from the corona. The corona is at a not, not the events that I've been showing you. There is also a steady expansion of the corona. It's always blowing out past us. And that solar wind, I'll tell you the story. That was predicted uh, by Gene Parker in the early 60s. And he got into a big fight um, with people who didn't believe that there was such a thing. It was actually the late 50s. And he predicted there would be a supersonic outflow of particles from the corona uh, because it's so hot that the gravitational field can't contain it. Um, and it wasn't until 1962, that a spacecraft was sent out uh, to pass Venus, uh, and a JPL scientist named Marcia Neugebauer uh, put a device on it to measure the solar wind and found that indeed there was a supersonic solar wind coming from the sun. So Parker was vindicated. What that solar wind does is it distorts the magnetic field of the Earth. Basically blows it back so there's a tail behind the Earth. There's a place where the field is oppositely directed because of this folding over. You get a plasma sheet in between, the magnetotail it's called. And when you get one of these dynamic events from the sun, a coronal mass ejection, which brings magnetic field with it, which brings hot plasma and field, it's a whole magnetized cloud, which interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, cuts it by this process called magnetic reconnection, sends the field back. The field converges on the other side of the sun at the magnetotail, reconnects again, sends field back this way, and you get particles crashing down on us that produce aurora. 
So the aurora, which a lot of people think is particles coming from the sun, it's not that simple. It's really this whole complex web of interactions that ends up producing particles, but mostly coming from the other direction. And what one of these events looks like, you'll see it come in and push back the field. That is the magnetic tail, there's the Earth. So that was a small event. Uh, that's what an aurora looks like from the ground. But because it's coming in at the poles, that's what it looks like from above. This is a satellite looking down at the North Pole. And you get the aurora produced typically at around uh, 60 degrees. It doesn't really come all the way to the poles. The most intense aurora are at the auroral oval. There's another one down below at the south. Looks the same. Um, are they are they typical? Oh. I'll just no. I'll just show you. I'll t if I turn the sound off, if I can. There we go. Are they um, synchronized in north and south? I yes, mean? they are. Oh. When you get a magnetic storm, you get intense aurora at both poles at the same time. This is no. recent pictures? Those what? Recently, those pictures? Those photos, recently? Um, there's a satellite up observing it right now. Right now. If you go to a site called spaceweather.com, they will show you the current aurora oval. You can click on it see what's happening at both poles right now. And would the Earth tilted this way? Yes. The North Pole would be like where Hudson Bay will be, like that direction. I, I saw the map, you know, it's close. Is there a Wi-Fi here? There is. Because if I'm done, we can connect to it, maybe. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you what it looks like right now. Yeah. Now, it seems from looking at what's happening on other planets as if we're very lucky to have a magnetic field. Um, on Mars, uh, it's looking as if Mars used to have a magnetic field and it used to have an atmosphere. Uh, and the solar wind combined with those mass ejections over millions of years eroded the atmosphere so Mars lost its atmosphere um, because its magnetic, its dynamo cooled, stopped producing a magnetic field. The corona. What? The corona in the Mars. The, the, corona 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 is the, the magnetic dynamo. It's <coughs> all the corona. The, the, the iron core cooled and stopped circulating. Um, so I, I just want to show you a little more. One of my favorite observations that we've been able to achieve uh, <coughs> in all the years I've been doing this, there was a pair of spacecraft sent up called Stereo. Uh, the idea was to look at these ejections to try to understand more about them. Uh, one of the spacecraft went, was sent ahead of the Earth in its orbit. The other spacecraft was sent behind the Earth. And after a few years, they got to where they could see the Sun and the Earth at the same time, all in the same field of view. So they had several different instruments with successively larger and larger fields of view. This isn't to scale one degree, ten degrees, hundred degrees. So, it's, it's squashed over at that end. But here's the sun, 
the low corona, the white light corona that you can see above that, a wide field white light image, something called a heliospheric imager, which sees even further from the sun. And in this picture, not to the same scale as that, there's the moon, there's the earth. And this is the uh, region near the earth. So what you'll see in this movie is the solar wind, a background of expanding solar wind. It doesn't look anything like what we thought it would look like. And there's, on top of it, there will be a mass ejection which blows right through the wind and hits us. And you'll see the amount of solar wind indicated by that little speedometer there. So there's the, the steady background of solar wind. There was the mass ejection piling up, ramming through it, passing the moon, hitting the earth, and you'll see when it hits. <laughs> it's just a spectacular achievement to be able to see this. That's cool. Wow. I really didn't think it was possible. In <laughs> fact, I was very skeptical uh, that they'd be able to do that. What, I mean, uh, what light is that? Is that just visible light or is that... Um... This is x-ray. This is visible light. The rest and of the way. Is it stronger when we have winter solstice? Or, you know, yes. I said this winter solstice, does the sun, if we here, we are here, the earth, you know, when we hit that plate, will be weaker than we'll be up here? When, does it matter? It's a tiny, tiny difference. Oh, it depends where we are on the orbit of the, the sun. I mean, it's always hit the belly, hit the, the, the earth. The, the earth is, as you saw, pretty small mm -hmm. compared to all of this. So, Try to get, uh, get back here. <clears throat> okay, to finish up, what is what does all this do to us, and what are we doing about it? So I'll leave the sun and I'll talk about the Earth now. So, really, in a, in a non-technological society, you hardly notice any of this. It doesn't affect, uh, it doesn't affect that kind of uh, culture very much. Uh, it's our highly in interdependent and technologically dependent society that uh, can be affected. I mean, first, it produces radiation, so empty space is, is not empty, and being up there is very dangerous. Um, the upper atmosphere can be affected by this activity because it deposits energy in the very upper atmosphere, and there's very little of that atmosphere. I'm talking about what's called the thermosphere. Um, which is one one thousandth of the density of the atmosphere down here. So it can be affected by fairly small amounts of energy. Um, for low, alt low Earth orbit spacecraft, how long they stay in orbit can be affected by that expanding atmosphere. And it might affect the circulation of the atmosphere as well. So even if you don't affect global warming, on average you can affect the distribution, uh, perhaps. It, it's, How? it's an active research area right now. How would it affect the distribution? Uh, it would change the circulation patterns. Via heat or via magnetic effects or what? Well, it's, it would be where the rainy seasons occur in Africa, for instance. It would drift north and south, depending on the circulation, where it goes up and where it comes down. 
you know, the 11-year cycle does show up in our weather patterns. Uh, so they are affected. Of course, whenever you have anything cyclical, it's easier to find because you have it repeated many times. Now, does the uh, does the direction or the uh, of the coronal mass ejection from where this, it, it comes from the sun relative to the Earth matter? It does a lot. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll finish up by talking about oh. that. We're working on that right mm -hmm. now. Oh. Okay. Um, Okay, so there are currents induced by the changing magnetic field. Uh, it can kill satellites. Satellites have been destroyed by these uh, effects. Um, it can also induce currents in power distribution systems on the ground. Transformers have exploded because of these induced currents. Um, event we might all know about is 1989, the whole northeast up into Canada had a big blackout that was caused by such an event from the sun. Uh, the most widely talked about one is the so-called Carrington event, 1859. It was before we had all, all these measurements, but uh, Carrington saw an, um, an event on the sun that he recorded. Um, 18 hours later, uh, telegraph wires caught fire. Uh, aurorae were seen down at the equator. It lasted for days. So we estimate that this was a bigger event than anything we've seen in modern times. There's some evidence also that there was another such event in the 1700s. It was recorded in South America. Or again, they saw Aurora uh, down near the equator. That just never happens now. So there's, uh, there is now a National Space Weather Service, um, and many other countries have such a service as well. In the UK, there's the Met Office. ESA, ESA has a Space Situational Awareness Office. Um, and they're all designed to predict when such events are going to happen, or at the very least to monitor for them. And there's a big push on right now to uh, improve the capabilities. NASA over the years has done a lot. Uh, these are the various spacecraft that they've uh, launched going all the way back to Voyager, but Voyager has traversed the heliosphere, the whole sphere of influence of the sun, so it, it contributes uh, to this. There are spacecraft that measure the solar wind, the magnetic fields, the particles coming from the sun. These are instruments that look at the corona, Solar Probe will be launched this summer. It's going to go in as close to the sun as you can get without melting. ESA is building a similar instrument. Doesn't get in quite as close, but it will uh, observe the sun in a way that probe doesn't actually. It will come in close enough to the sun to actually stay synchronous for a whole month over the same spot on the sun. And then it will come back. And both of them will come back and do the same thing later. Excuse me, this is when you say in the US that they, do they, they swap information or they, or they actually broadcast everybody? I'm not sure what the ESA policy is. Um, 
the, the NASA policy is to make the data available to everyone, um, at least after a short processing period. I think ESA will do the same. I'm not sure. Can you say what ESA is? What? What is ESA? ESA? Uh -huh. Sorry. I'm so used to acronyms. So NASA is the National Atmospheric Space Administration. ESA is the European Space Agency. They still using the, the metric and the the that, or they correct that because they lost five hundred million dollars satellite back in the nineties because of that mistake. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. No, like this. Is that true? Or they keep keep it separately. We, we put an X-ray telescope on this. Our instrument was built with uh, the U.S. system. The Japanese spacecraft was built metrically. And the only problem we had was with the bolt that attached us to that. <laughs> it took a long time to negotiate that. <laughs> We'll have to fix it, yeah. We gotta fix that first. So what's under discussion right now, at least over in Europe, is a mission to give us a better view of what's happening. So there's the Earth, there's the Sun. This French mathematician Lagrange, who did all these amazing calculations back in the early 19th century, figured out that when you have two bodies, one orbiting the other, there are five points in the space around these bodies that are stable in the sense that if you put something here at L1, this Lagrange point, the gravitational attraction of the Earth balances the gravitational attraction of the Sun, and it is stable. So we have spacecraft at that position, um, sitting there, tracking the Earth as it goes around the Sun, they're about a million miles out, so you can detect events that are coming toward us. Um, the biggest problem uh, in terms of predicting these events, there are two main problems. One is if you look this way to see an event coming toward us, uh, the sun itself blocks your view. It's so big and bright. It's hard to find, it's hard to see the event. And the other is that you'd like to have more warning than just seeing it leave. So what's under, what's being planned right now is to put a satellite at this point called L5. There's these other stable points, L2, L3, L4, and L5. It's only the French over in Europe who are arguing for L4. Everyone else agrees L5 is where you should be. <laughs> um, the advantage of L5 is when an event heads toward the Earth, you can see it. You've got this nice sideways view. You can also see what's coming around on the sun. The sun rotates this way, so you can see things coming before they're visible from the Earth. And that gives you more advanced warning. So that is the planning for this is happening right now. It's an ESA mission, a European mission. Some of us here would like to have NASA join in it. It would be a better mission if uh, NASA were part of it. Um, and we're trying to make it happen. And that's where I'll leave you.
Great. Great.